I've been waiting my whole life to say good morning, Baltimore. Uh, my name's David Matlow, as you heard, and I am speaking to you from Toronto, Canada. And this presentation is called Artifacts of Independence. As you heard, I have the world's largest collection of Theodore Herzl memorabilia. We're so is an ice relating to the birth of the state of Israel, which will be, which we celebrated in the Jewish calendar on April 29th, and in the secular calendar on May 14th, two days from now. And the collage on the left is a selection of items um, from my collection that relate to Israel's independence and its early days. And since I've been a kid, I've been fascinated with where Israel came from. How did it happen? It's unparalleled in the history of humanity or civilization. And in this presentation, through some of the items in my collection, I will try and share th that story that jumps off the pages from my collection. Um, but first, um, we're in the uh, period of the coronavirus. So this is Herzl in his Magen David Adom uh, uniform as a physician. So I just wanted to give a shout out to any uh, uh, frontline medical workers, anyone who is helping um, Canada and the United States and internationally get through this crisis, doctors, nurses, paramedics, and other essential service workers. And I hope everyone is, is safe and doing well. In this presentation, I will take you from Theodore Herzl to David Ben-Gurion and talk about how the State of Israel came to be. It started with Herzl, as you heard, I am the, uh, I have the world's largest collection. Herzl was born in 1860, he died in 1904, and he dedicated the last eight years of his life from 1896 to his death in 1904 to the Zionist dream, what became the Zionist dream the creation of a homeland for the Jewish people and the Baltimore Zionist district is um, a modern iteration of that dream initiated with Herzl. And the dream started in this book, the Judenstadt, uh, translated into Hebrew, Midinat HaYehudim. And you can see an early English translation of the book called A Jewish State, sometimes called The Jewish State. But if you can see in the small print in the top right, the subtitle of this book was an attempt at a modern solution of the Jewish question. And that the Jewish question was anti-Semitism. Herzl was deathly afraid of what the future of the Jewish people would look like in Europe where he lived. He, he was born in Hungary and lived in, in Vienna. And, um, and so that's what he was afraid of and now uh, with the uh, perspective of history, we know how right he was. Interestingly, in the, in the bottom right is a version of the uh, Judenstadt in Yiddish. This particular edition was from um, printed in, in Boston in the 1920s. And you'll see the Zionist flag, which later became the flag of the State of Israel, and the American flag together. And you'll see that a number of times. It's reflective of, of the passion of um, Jewish communities around the world, including and perhaps primarily that in, in the United States, and of course the, the shared values that, that Israel and the United States have in terms of freedom and liberty and the pursuit of a better life. The first thing that Herzl did um, in the fulfillment of his dream, and the Judenstadt talked about creating a Jewish state and What's important about Herzl was that he just, he wasn't just a dreamer. He just didn't have an idea and let other people take it over or not take it over. He actually went about to do something to make it happen. And the first thing that he did of great significance was, was convene the first a Zionist Congress, what became the first Zionist Congress in Basel in August of 1897. And before you is an invitation in Hebrew, um, inviting people to come to Basel to uh, participate in the first Zionist Congress. So what's interesting, firstly, it was in Hebrew, 
there was English and German versions of this. The language of Zionism was primarily German, which is what, what Herzl spoke, but this particular version is in Hebrew. And in the, towards the end, it says, please come. And if you're interested, there is a kosher hotel in Basel and we can speak Hebrew there. Even though Herzl didn't speak Hebrew, he recognized the importance of, of Hebrew to the Zionist dream. And, and there was one American who went to Basel to participate in the first Zionist Congress, Rabbi Shepsel Schaefer of Sherit Yisrael, who represented the Zionist Association of Baltimore at the First Zionist Congress. So there is a long um, and very uh, history of Baltimore in Herzl's story and as in the more grandly the Zionist story, which I'll talk about. So this was the First Zionist Congress in August of 1897. And at the, the Congress, at every Congress, and I have a complete collection of those, but this is a postcard from the first Zionist Congress, people were so pleased, so proud to be able to be in attendance at these Congresses. They would buy or be given a postcard and they would send it to their uh, friends, relatives back home saying, guess what, this is where I am. I'm talking, I'm part of a meeting that's talking about planning the future of the Jewish people. And what's interesting about this postcard is you can see some of you can see the imagery that Herzl wanted to convey about what that Zionist dream would look like. On the left, of course, it's the the Kotel, the Western Wall, and on the right, a farmer planting his field. And throughout uh, Herzl's life and beyond, there were he relied on images and symbols to convey the message. How do you get a disparate people living in the shtetls? I picture Anatevka, but also in London and Paris and, and in Vienna and New York and Baltimore and Philadelphia, how to galvanize people behind his idea. And part of it was the use of symbols, which makes so many beautiful things ripe for my collection. At the Second Zionist Congress, the, which was also in Basel, one year later in 1898, the delegates resolved to create an entity called the Jewish Colonial Trust. Herzl was a polypotentialite. He, what I mean by that is he knew so many things. He was skilled and knowledgeable in so many things, and one of them was economics and, and, and finance. And he understood that the Jewish state to be requires a financing vehicle. And so from very early on, he dedicated himself to creating a Jewish bank. And this was the Jewish Colonial Trust, chartered under the laws of England, which hundreds of thousands of shares, one share at a time, to Jews around the world, uh, including in the in the united states as early as 1898 when this started each share was one pound sterling and one pound was very expensive for many people and so what were created were share clubs and i'll just hold this up i know it's small but if you put aside 10 cents or so we would get sticker and when you filled a book like this like green stamps you would have enough shares, enough stickers, and you would buy yourself a share. The Jewish Colonial Trust um, created a subsidiary, which I'll talk about in a second, but through a series of um, amalgamations and restructurings after is Israel became independent, the Jewish Colonial Trust continues to exist as the Bank Lumi, one of Israel's major banks. The actual banks were a subsidiary of the Jewish colonial trust and in 1931 changed its name to the Anglo-Palestine Bank and you'll see in a few minutes how critical this entity was in the early days of the state of Israel but this Anglo-Palestine company opened branches People would give deposits, and like any bank, the, the deposits were accumulated and the funds were, were loaned 
to um, groups who were settling Palestine. The initial uh, capital that was used to buy the land that was now Tel Aviv was funded through the Anglo-Palestine Bank. And ultimately, it had branches in Tiberias and Jerusalem and Jaffa, and if you can believe it, also in Gaza and Beirut. And as I said, this is now the uh, Bank Lumi. Herzl died in 1904, but his dream did not die with him. And of course, I'm glossing over very important parts of the story to focus on the items. But in, in 1917, um, as the continuation of Herzl's work and dream, because he created an organization, the World Zionist Organization, of which the, the American Zionist movement is a current um, constituent member, of which the Baltimore Zionist District is a member. So he created an organization to continue after his passing. And the work of the Zionist organization enabled the Balfour Declaration, which was a declaration of the cabinet of England towards the end of World War I on November 2nd, 1917, where the British government viewed with favor the creation of a, of a home for the Jewish people. So this is a, an old-fashioned machberet that we would have used when we were in, in Hebrew school. This one is from the 1920s, and there's Herzl on the cover. And you'll see again, this is um, the... Um, which you can see in the bottom, its, it's uh, address was on Delancey Street, but on the back of the cover, uh, back of the machberet was this which is the text of the Balfour Declaration in English and Hebrew with the Zionist flag again on the right, the Lion of Judah up on top, and the Union Jack, the, the British flag. And, and so if you were uh, a, a student in Cheder in the 1920s, you'd have this Machberet with Herzl on the front and the Balfour Declaration on the back. So, um, as I said, Herzl was not just about dreams and ideas, but about doing. And so with the Balfour Declaration, even before, but it, it got a great impetus with the Balfour Declaration and the loss of the Ottoman Empire uh, during World War I. And so Britain took over the um, supervision of Eretz Israel, Palestine, uh, under the British mandate. And Jewish communities around the world started, in, including, of course, the Yeshuv, the citizens of Eretz Israel at the time. There were 600,000 of them or, or so by independence in 1948, as a partnership with Jews from around the world. So this is a, a document from 1922. It's called the Karen Heisod Sacrifice Bond, the Karen Heisod literally is the foundation fund. This was established to raise funds to do things in, in Palestine. Uh, Albert Einstein and Chaim Weizmann came to the United States in 1921 to raise money for the Karen Heisod. Some of those funds raised bought the land that, uh, that established the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. This particular document, it's called the Sacrifice Bond. And it's hard to read the fine print in italics, but essentially it says it is, is more sacrifice than bond because you're, it yields no return in money. Your return will be consciousness of duty performed by making this thousand dollar gift. And I have a series of them, $5, $10, $25, $50, but I put the most expensive one in this presentation. And essentially, this was um, a donation to the building of Palestine as a homeland for the Jewish people. And of course, there's Herzl front and center, and in Hebrew, if I forget you, Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its coming. Um, I'm going the wrong way. Okay. The, um, this is a postcard. For those who don't speak Russian, this is Tel Aviv. This is Herzl Street in Tel Aviv. Now, 
For those of us who've been to Tel Aviv, you no longer see, don see donkeys carrying things down the main street. But this is the early days of Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv was established in 1909 with funding that came from, as I said earlier, the Anglo-Palestine Bank. And um, outside the, the old and ancient city of Jaffa to build an all new modern Jewish city. And um, as you can see in the 111 years since Tel Aviv was created, what uh, a metropolis it has become. At the end of this picture, you can see if you go down the street to the middle, you see a building. That is the Herzliya School, the first Hebrew language uh, modern school established in, in Eretz Yisrael. This building, unfortunately, in the late 50s was destroyed and the Shalom Mayer Tower in Tel Aviv is, is on this spot. But you can see that the work of building the land um, commenced and, and became ongoing. This is an image of Herzl overlooking, and this is from the 1930s, just a modern depiction. This would be the port of Haifa and Herzl's motto, Im Tirzu Enzo Agada. If you will it, it is not a dream, which was really the theme for everything that happened uh, that led to the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. And it's something that is uh, an inspiration for me to this day. But when he says, if you, if you will it, it is no dream, he, he, he didn't mean it just if you want something badly enough, it can happen. Taking his example, if you want something badly enough and work hard to make it happen and use your skills and talents and work and plan and, and sacrifice, obviously a lot of sacrifice went into the creation and then the pr preservation of the state of Israel, it could happen. There were 22 Zionist Congresses prior to independence. Now, people are surprised to hear that. They might know about the first Zionist Congress, which we talked about earlier. They may know the picture of Herzl standing back in the overlooked Rhine River. That's at the Three Kings Hotel in Basel, and that took place at the fifth Zionist Congress but there were actually 22 Zionist Congresses before Israel's independence. This is the delegate ticket to the 22nd Zionist Congress, which took place in Basel in 1946. The 21st Zionist Congress took place in Zurich in August of 1939, literally ending one day before the start of World War II, which of course began on September 1st, 1939. This, um, as I said earlier, Herzl was deathly afraid of what would happen to the Jewish people in Europe. He saw storm clouds coming. Even in his worst imagination, he couldn't have um, imagined what happened. We, we all know what happened. And um, uh, the, the, the whole um, period of the Shoah, tragic in the extreme, no words can describe it. It's not the subject of this presentation other than to say that it emphasized the need for a Jewish homeland. It confirmed the require why the Zionist movement was critical and it validated all the work because when the opportunity came to have the Jewish state, unfortunately too late for the victims of the Shoah, the Jewish uh, people in, in Eretz Israel and around the world were ready to um, realize upon it. But this uh, demonstrates that there were 22 Congresses and the first order of business at this Congress in Basel was essentially seeing who has survived the Shoah, which Zionists made it. And this continued the efforts to create the, the Jewish state at this particular time there were um, many survivors in displaced persons camps throughout Europe with no place to go. And one of the 
things that Jewish communities around the world and in Eretz Yisrael tried to do was to bring the um, the survivors to back home to Eretz Yisrael. This is a picture of the Theodore Herzl, which was an illegal immigrant ship that traveled from Europe to Palestine in April of 1947. It was boarded by the British. Three of the um, people on the ship were killed by the British boarding, but there were many, many ships that tried to run the British blockade to bring the survivors to, to Palestine. And importantly for the city of Baltimore, the famous illegal immigrant ship, the Exodus, was the former President Warfield, which was a ferry that on Chesapeake Bay that took people, if, if my geography is right, from North Norfolk, Virginia to Baltimore. It was purchased by a group led by a gentleman, Mose I. Spirit, who was a liquor distributor in Baltimore. This gentleman was also involved in purchasing guns and other ammunition to ship to Palestine to help in the War of Independence. And he led a group to buy the President Warfield, uh, which became the famous Exodus ship. The, there obviously was a serious uh, uh, problem in Eretz Israel because the British were not allowing uh, immigrants, the illegal immigrant ships would be coming. There was violence between the Arab community and the Jewish population. The British were in the middle of this and making a long story very short, they essentially threw their hands up in the air and kicked it back to the United Nations to, to, tell, to ask the United Nations, to, you figure out what to do. We have the British mandate. Essentially, we give up, you, you figure out what to do. So the United Nations sent a delegation to Palestine, uh, interviewed representatives of the Jewish community, the Arab community, and ultimately came back with a recommendation to partition Eretz Yisrael into a, into a Jewish state, a Arab state, and Jerusalem, as an international city. And this was brought before a vote of the United Nations in Lake Success, New York, uh, in 1947, November 29th, 1947 to be exact. And the United Nations voted in favor of the partition resolution, which ultimately uh, was the, uh, gave right to the Jewish community of, Pal of Palestine to have a state there. Now Herzl, to tie the beginning and this together, Herzl in his diary after the First Zionist Congress in 1947 wrote, in Basel I created the Jewish state. If I said this today, people think, would think I'm crazy, but in maybe in five years, but certainly in 50 years, people will know I was right. That was in 1897, 50 years later, we're in 1947. And so this was the UN partition resolution was indeed passed, which was a cause of great celebration. This is the newspaper in Israel the next day, which talks about the great celebration and happiness. Uh, it's very small, but you can see a picture of, of people pouring out into the streets with flags to, to celebrate. And so this was in November of 1947. The British mandate was set to expire six months later, and um, that the British decided to leave on Saturday, May 15th. Leaving on Saturday was, was frankly, a final shtoch of the British to leave on a Saturday, and obviously the uh, declaration of the State of Israel could not take place on Shabbat, but this particular document was from the Thursday before. So that's May 13th, 1948. It is a pamphlet for a special prayer service to take place on the eve of the um, fateful day in the Holy Land where the British mandate 
would end. And it ended on, uh, with the declaration of the State of Israel on Friday, May 14th. This is the invitation to the Declaration of Independence Ceremony. Such a, a momentous event in the history of the Jewish people, unparalleled, as I said earlier, in the history of civilization. The, the invitation to this was run on a mimeograph machine or a cassette machine or whatever they had, and it's a folded piece of plain paper. There were about 250 people invited, and it says that um, you're, you can see the date, May 13th, 1948, so that's the Thursday, you're invited to come to the meeting where we're going to declare independence, which will take place on Friday, hey, B -E -R, um, you can see in brackets, May 14th, 1948, at four o'clock in the uh, Tel Aviv Museum, which is on Shderot Rothschild 16, which is um, Independence Hall. Currently, Independence Hall. It was formerly the Tel Aviv Museum. Before that, Mayor Diesendorf's home. Um, we're asking that you keep this a secret, and um, either, including the content of this, please be in your seats by 3:30. And in the small print at the bottom, this invitation is personal, i.e., it's not transferable. You can't put it up on StubHub, and um, were please wear light festive clothing. And even though it was intended to be kept secret by the time David Van Guren showed up, you can see there were crowds and crowds of people uh, surrounding the museum. And David Van Guren um, read the Declaration of Independence under a picture of Herzl. Now you'll see there's a circle in the middle and circles around it for Young people in the audience who may not know what this is, this was a record. Um, but this is a, a record of uh, David Van Guren reading the Declaration of Independence. And fittingly, he's under a portrait of Herzl. And the, the what makes that so fitting is that, firstly, it's not like the museum looked like this before. This was designed. The, David Van Guren retained a graphic designer to design this setting because he knew this would be an iconic photograph and the picture of, of Herzl, which came from the offices of the Jewish National Fund, was put above his head to tie the dream of Herzl with its realization with the Declaration of Independence. This newspaper, which Ariel mentioned earlier, um, is Yom Habedida, the date of the state. This is a joint newspaper, a joint edition of all the Israeli newspapers, which came out at 4.30 p.m. on Friday, May the 14th. Ha'am Achriz al Medinat Yisrael, the nation declares Medinat Yisrael, the state of Israel. Now, we talked earlier about um, Herzl being a doer and, the, and all the effort and everything that was required to create the state of Israel. And if you can imagine all the things you need in order to have a country, and Herzl started the Jewish people in preparing for this day. And just one small example, postage stamps. We take it for granted when we can go outside and go to a post office that you can buy stamps and send mail. But this was a brand new country. And so um, every country needs a postal service, more so in 1948 than, than today. But you can see this is a first day cover, May 16th, 1948. So it's the Sunday, which was the first date of sale of postage stamps. Right? They wouldn't go for, post offices aren't own, uh, open on Shabbat in Israel. And you can see it says Doar Ivri, Hebrew Post. And the reason it says Hebrew Post is until David Ben Gurion declared the state at four o'clock on the Friday, nobody knew what the name of the country would be. But they had to prepare stamps in anticipation. So Doar Ivri means Hebrew Post. This, would be, this was the first time ever that there'd be such a thing as Hebrew Post. 
I mentioned earlier that the Anglo-Palestine Bank played a role in the, a bigger role in the story of independence. Every country needs bank notes as well. And so there was no uh, Bank of Israel or Federal Reserve Bank or equivalent immediately. And so the Anglo-Palestine Bank was the first issuer of currency for the state of Israel. This bank note came into um, trading uh, became legal tender in August of 1948. And you can see it's the Anglo-Palestine Bank within a few, um, and also what's called 10 Palestine pounds, even though the state of Israel existed because the bank notes were printed earlier and had to then, they had to be printed secretly and then secretly shipped to, to Israel. And so they were clearly printed before the name of the country was established and very quickly they transitioned to to be um, uh, liras and then ultimately shekels years later. So this again, all the work, all the preparation was necessary for the state of Israel to be up and running um, right on independence. Of course, there's there's a whole other many chapters. The, one of the most important is the Haganah, which was a, a, the an army in creation, which morphed into becoming Tzahal right on independence. Um, the um, state of Israel from its creation, from before its creation, and even today is a joint project of the Jewish people in Eretz Israel and outside of Eretz Israel, or now Medinat Israel. And this is just one example. This is the advertisement for the 1948 campaign of the United Jewish Appeal. And uh, this particular ad was from before independence because it talks about the partition resolution in 19, uh, November 29, $40 to help be able to preserve and protect it. Um, really, uh, a campaign to decide the destiny of a whole people. I love this image. This is a, um, I think it's the, it's the program from an event that took place in Madison Square Gardens in December of 1948. It's the annual Night of Stars where Broadway and movie stars would come and they'd have a big shindig for the United Palestine Appeal uh, in New York. And this is such an iconic image of the early Israeli, both a farm, farming the land, working the land with a gun over his shoulder to protect himself and, and the country. And interesting, the, 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 the artist chose for the, for the biblical reference at the top, and Jacob shall return and none shall make him afraid. The point of the state of Israel is that we should be, be able to live in freedom and safety and also by bringing the Jewish people together, the creativity that could be unleashed both Jewishly, secularly in science and technology and, and now we're seeing medical innovation, that was the idea. Um, and to be able to do that, being unafraid. Yom HaTzmaut is a great celebration, Israel's Independence Day. We celebrated it a couple of weeks ago, on, as I said, on April 29th, and the secular anniversary is, is coming up on Thursday. The, this was an early postcard, in a sense, self-congratulatory, Mazel Tov Medina, congratulations, state. And this was in 1948, and you can see the imagery, of course, the Magen David, the Star of David, in Hebrew around it, Im Eshkachech Yerushalayim Tishkach Yemini. Um, and in the middle, uh, a stylized picture of Eretz Israel with Yerushalayim, but the quote, Od lo avda tikvatenu, we have not lost our hope. And that, of course, is from the Hatikva, um, which was an anthem of the Zionist movement that later, of course, is now the um, national anthem of the state of Israel. These are two versions of it from the early 1900s. On the left is from the Hebrew publishing company in New York, and the, on the right from Odessa in Russia. This was um, 
this was a, a dream that Herzl started us on the road. He couldn't have done it himself, even if we, he were alive the, for the full time. It was a joint and continues to be a joint enterprise of the Jewish people from around the world. And in particular to our American friends between America and Israel. This is a postcard from 1914. Again, for the third time we see in this presentation, linking the flag of the state of Israel or the Zionist flag at the time and the, and the flag of America. Shared values, shared uh, and, and, and such great uh, passion and contribution from Jews in the state of Israel, uh, in the United States, to, to nurture and support this, this dream. And because I'm speaking to Amer an American audience um, primarily, uh, it goes without saying that the support of uh, the United citizens of the United States to Israel has been critical to all that has been achieved. Um, with that, it ends the formal part of the presentation and answer any questions. Thank you so much, David. That was absolutely unbelievable. I'm, I'm completely blown away. So let's get to these questions. Hi, David. Do you collect Israeli stamps? Uh, yes, Jacob, I do. So I, I'm a collector. I, I, I've always collected things. One of my earliest collections was Israeli stamps. So starting from when I was about 10 years old, and the thing about buying is about Israeli stamps, it's a finite period. It's 72 years of stamps. I have all of them. And um, in fact, just today, I got in the mail the current edition of the Israel Philatelist. So yes, there, there is a community of stamp collectors, not as many as there might have been 20 or so years ago. Um, I was once in my office looking at stamps on eBay and a young lawyer came into the office and my office and said, what are you doing? I'm saying, I'm looking at stamps. And he said, I've never met a stamp collector in his life. When I was a kid, there were many, many of us. So yes, I do collect Israeli stamps. And it's a great way to, to follow history. And some of the early, early ones really are historic, like the Dory re-stamps that, that I, wow, I showed in fantastic. the presentation. Um, Alan Levitt asks, how many bonds or how much money did the Zionists raise in the 1920s? So the particular number, I don't know, but I, I guess if you were a fundraiser at the time, you would say not enough. Um, there, um, I have many things in my collection, including from Herzl's days, letters saying, People, you've got to make your contributions. We're, we're short on money. Um, and so that, that continues to be true and probably especially true now um, within the coronavirus period, but as a community, we'll, we'll work, work out of it. So I don't, I don't know the answer to that in terms of numbers. I think there, I, I really don't know. But, but um, suffice, uh, I, I recently read a book um, it's called the, the Fish That Ate the Whale about a gentleman named Sam Zemery, who was a banana merchant in New Orleans and then um, ultimately bought United Fruit. And this is in the early part of the century. And a portion of it is a visit by Chaim Weitzman to him in New Orleans to, uh, to fundraise for him directly, from him directly. And he gave in the 1920s $500,000, which was, it's a lot of money now, but imagine 100 years ago, which went to um, build a power plant in, in, in Israel. There's a power plant in, in Tel Aviv near what used to be the airport. And there, there's another up, up north near Tiberias. So is, the Jewish community was building this infrastructure. It was the Karen Haisod that raised funds for that for that. So there's one example of a 500,000 contribution. He, he later gave another $750,000 to fund the, the um, uh, movement of Jews from Europe to Palestine before, before the gates uh, closed in the 1930s. But in terms of an overall number, I, I don't know. But the Karen Haisod um, website has has lots of information so perhaps they have more detailed financial information okay. um and the last question 
how did you build up your collection over and over what period of time? This was from Stan Potts. Um, thanks. Thank you, Stan, for the question. I started collecting, I would say, 30 years ago. Um, the first item in my collection was a portrait of Herzl that hung in my grandparents' home in Ramat Gan. They moved from, they were in, originally from Belarus. They came to Toronto, uh, built a business, had a family, and but decided in 1954, when the State of Israel was created, to fulfill their dream and go and live there. And so uh, we used to go there in the 60s to visit as, as kids. And in their home in Ramadan was a portrait of Herzl uh, that hung in a fancy frame in their, in their main room. And uh, when my grandmother died in 1991, um, I asked for that. So that was item one in my collection. So that's 30 years ago. And it's grown in a number of ways, primarily with the advent of the computer, which allows me to tap into and find Herzl items anywhere in the world. And I'm now uh, a pretty out, pretty dominant as a collector, at least the algorithm in, in Toronto. If you put in Herzl's name, my picture shows up. Um, and so from time to time, I get um, emails from, I'm 59 years old and that, that's not very young, but in the, in the world of Herzl collecting, I'm extremely young. And so there have been a number of collectors who have wanted to, to entrust their collection to, um, to a good home. So I bought collections. Every now and again, I just get in the mail a Herzl item. Somebody is cleaning their grandparents' apartment and they don't want to throw it out and they know I take care of it. So I build it that way. Certain things on eBay, stamp auctions, but it's about, about 30 years or so. So when, when people come into our house, there is a giant um, cabinet with Herzl items and people's first reaction is, you have a very nice wife <laughs> because she allows me to do this. And, and there's, uh, every, there's every room in the house has Herzl in it, except one, our daughter Yael has declared her room a Herzl free zone. But other than that, there's Herzl wow. everywhere. You can see in behind me, these are all shelves and boxes, uh, archival boxes, um, of, of Maybe Herzl. we'll do a, a you know a tour at some point. <laughs> well, let me show one item, just that, that wasn't in the presentation. So what this is, this is I, I mentioned in the presentation. This is the picture of Herzl on the balcony in Basel. It was it was taken uh, in 1901 at the Fifth Zionist Congress. It became an iconic image of of Herzl looking into the future. This particular one is signed by Herzl. So what this means is that Herzl was like a rock star, right? In 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 Baltimore, Cal Ripken, right? If you to get a Cal Ripken card, baseball card, and go up to him and have him sign it, uh, that's what Herzl was like. And and because he galvanized the Jewish people so much, and and nobody would take a Cal Ripken signed card and throw it in the mail, but this was a postcard, and the person had it signed and then mailed it to a friend. Um, which is very interesting. It's a, it's a way of passing on and communicating this message. Wow, unbelievable. Well, I just want to thank you again. I'm going to um, hand it over to EZD's Executive Director, Karen Levin. Thank you, Ariel. David, thank you so much. I want to firstly um, say apologize for being a few minutes late. I'm not only tasked with um, reaching people like you to create these uh, great programs and, and lead the BZD. I'm also now tasked with uh, being a first and sixth grade teacher to my parent, to my children. So sorry for being late to this call, but I thank you on behalf of the BZD staff, the BZD board, and I know um, the over 60 people that we had on this call. Um, so thank you for the um, incredible presentation. Um, we truly do appreciate coming on this call and, and building our community, helping us to, um, you know, to help with um, us while we shelter in place, as I know you're sheltering in place in Canada, um, giving us so much information about Herzl and even 
building a connection between Baltimore um, and Hertzel. We really do appreciate that. Yeah. Stay Thank safe, you, David. Everybody. Yes, stay safe, be healthy. Thank you so much.